Let's consider an example that you tried as a preparatory exercise. This is a screenshot from OpenOffice's word processing program. OpenOffice is free software, but it's a direct competitor to Microsoft Office. People use both for the same purposes. They expect comparable quality levels. They expect to be able to easily pass files back and forth, sometimes editing in Word, sometimes editing in OpenOffice. Now this test shows how OpenOffice displays text in different font sizes. If you look closely, you can see that the program displays different fonts as the same. For example, letters that are 7.5 points and 8.5 points are displayed as the same size. Same for 13.5 points and 15, and for 16 and 18. People use OpenOffice for serious work, including laying out complex documents. If it can't display font sizes correctly, that's a serious problem. So do all the programs have OpenOffice's problem? Is an operating system failure? Let's consider WordPad. Now WordPad is another free program, but people only use this to do simple editing. It's not a page layout program. We wouldn't expect it to have the same precise control as OpenOffice. But when we look at this picture, it's not obvious that it has the same problem as OpenOffice. We can look more closely though. Let's set WordPad side by side with Microsoft Word. At first glance, they look similar. We can easily make our observations more precise. We just highlight the text in Word and in WordPad, and that'll show us how tall and how long each line is. We use that to compare the visual patterns that are shown by the two programs. This is one of the important tactics of test design. When results require human inspection, find a way to make a more thorough inspection easy. Side-by-side -side comparisons with a reference program go a long way toward that goal. Now in this case, we see that just like OpenOffice, WordPad doesn't handle differences in size consistently. It's more subtle than OpenOffice's problem, but if you look at the top six lines of the WordPad display, the third and the fourth line, they're about the same size, but they shouldn't be. So we see some differences. Word appears to size the fonts correctly. WordPad and OpenOffice obviously don't. Should we care about these differences? You know, there's no mechanical system that can answer that for you. You have to make your own judgment, human judgment. It's fallible, but it's what we've got. To evaluate a test result, it's useful to think about risk or consequence. In the case of WordPad, people don't use this to do serious word processing or precise page layout. So if it gets the font sizes a little wrong, it doesn't really matter. Now in contrast, for Word or InDesign, a professional desktop publishing program, or for OpenOffice, this is a big problem. All three programs are designed to encourage users to expect professional quality formatting of text. That's what they do. That's not what they're allowed to get wrong. In the preparatory exercise that was based on this example, you were asked to decide whether OpenOffice displays fonts correctly. Now we just demonstrated a simple comparison. In that comparison, the version of OpenOffice we tested failed. But if it had passed that, we still wouldn't be done. To test this thoroughly, we'd have to check a lot of things. We'd have to test with every font, because the program might handle some fonts perfectly but fail with others. I've seen this happen. Now this is often caused by a not quite standard encoding of a font. But if Word displays a font correctly and OpenOffice doesn't, that's a problem. We'd also have to test with every character. And we'd have to test interactions with a lot of other variables that might be relevant. When students work through this puzzle, they often say they can write programs to measure a character's size and assess from the program. But things aren't that simple. We can measure character height in points, but a character can be 10 points tall, but be much taller in one typeface than in another. So how tall is a 10-point character supposed to be? It's complicated. So instead, we often rely on simpler heuristics, such as comparing how big characters are relative to each other within the same typeface, or relative to the display of this character in another more trusted program. Let's review where we are. The Oracle idea is that we can determine whether a program failed or passed a test by comparing results to an expected result. And there are four problems with this. First, our expectations can be wrong. When we rely on specifications to set our expectations, we often discover that the spec is wrong or outdated. Similarly, if a program doesn't work the same way as a reference program, that's often because the reference program has a bug. Second, even if the program and the Oracle match, there can still be a bug. That's what the 2 plus 3 takes 5 hours example was about. No reference program covers all aspects of the comparison. No specification is complete. There are always aspects of the program. In most cases, there are very significant aspects of the program for which the tester has to figure out what's right and what's wrong for herself. Third, even if there's a mismatch, it might not be a problem. OpenOffice and WordPad had essentially the same bug with fonts, but I argued that it was a serious bug for OpenOffice and a trivial one for WordPad. When James teaches this, he says he wouldn't even report this bug. 
he just mentioned it informally to the programmers. To decide how seriously to take a bug, we have to rely on human judgment. The oracle rarely helps. Finally, there's the credibility problem. When you say a program is not working correctly, why should anybody believe you? Maybe no one will challenge you if the oracle is a specification or a respected reference, but what do you do when the program misbehaves in a way that isn't covered by an oracle that someone else told you to use? Do you ignore it? Do you report it anyway, but hope that you don't have to defend it? I report it, but I want to make sure the reader clearly understands why I think it's a problem. Bach and Bolton approach this in a different way. They ask what's the basis for the feeling when a program does something that doesn't feel right? How do testers argue that a program isn't working correctly? They developed a list of consistency heuristics that describe what they think are most people's expectations most of the time. For example, when you compare a program to a specification, or an advertisement, or a user manual, you're looking for inconsistencies with the company's claims about the product. As another example off their list, when you compare results with a reference program, you're looking for inconsistency with a comparable product. But there are limits to comparability. As we've seen, two products might be comparable in some ways, they might both add numbers, but incomparable in other ways, such as managing memory differently. So some of these comparison heuristics are going to work in some cases, and not others. Other comparisons aren't as clear-cut, because the reference points aren't laid out as clearly for you. For example, suppose the program makes it hard to do something. Does that matter or not? You might have to decide why people would use this product. If the reason they buy the product is to be able to do this task, and it's too hard, that's an inconsistency with their expectations. It'll make them grumpy. It's probably also an inconsistency with what our company thinks is the purpose of the product, what we intend people to want to do with it. The consistency heuristics rely on your knowledge. You're often not going to get that knowledge from an easy-to-use source like a well-written specification. You're going to have to go get it for yourself. Now let's consider one of the hardest issues to argue from, consistency with purpose. Sometimes it's obvious to everyone that a program is supposed to make a certain task easy, and so if it's obvious enough, all you have to say is, I'm trying to do this, and look at all the work it takes to do it. But other times, the programmers don't understand the purpose of the program, or they don't understand the benefit the program is supposed to give to the customer. This is especially a problem in companies that think of programmers as technicians who merely write code to implement whatever is given them in a specification. You see that attitude in a lot of textbooks, and that has infested too many companies. In these cases, when you report a problem, the programmers can say with justification, but we did what we were supposed to do. They can be right, but the program can still be defective. Your argument in this case is with whoever is telling the programmers what to do, not with the programmers themselves. To make your argument, or to learn that your perception is incorrect, you have to do your own research. You have to find sources of information that justify or refute your impression that the point of a program like this is to make tasks like that easy. But some of my colleagues tell me that at their company, testers aren't welcome to spend their time on this. That may be true at many companies, but you know the company only pays for 40 hours of your time. What you do with the rest of your time? Up to you. To a large degree, in my experience in North America, many of the things people do to advance their career, they do in their own time. Now at some companies, management doesn't want testers evaluating the design of the product at all. They only want to focus on implementation. And this is probably the right attitude at an independent test lab, especially if you're working on a product that you're only ever going to test once. But I also see this attitude at some companies who test their own software, like IT organizations who develop software for in-house use. Look, whenever you're going to argue about purpose, you have to be careful. You have to pick your arguments. You have to make sure that you're right before you speak. You have to make sure your sources of information will be good enough that people will want to pay attention to them. But if you have that, it'll usually benefit your company to hear what you have to say. And over the long term, it will probably benefit you. Let me sum up on the consistency oracles. We use these in three common ways. When we find a bug, we try to figure out why it's a bug. If the answer isn't obvious, it's useful to ask, what type of inconsistency am I reacting to? And then we do some research to see if our hunch that something is wrong is something we should act on. Then when we report a bug, we sometimes need to explain why we think it's a bug. These heuristics often guide our thinking about how to structure that explanation. I think this is a bug because I think people will expect it to do something else. And I think that because. And finally, we use these oracles to guide test design. Anytime I know what the product is supposed to do, I can design tests to check whether the product does it.